Hi, this is Eric Archer from TI, and today we're going to learn about how Earth works. And to help us learn about that, we have the Hip Hop MD uh, who's going to walk us through it. Hip Hop MD, are you ready to walk us through it? I am absolutely ready to walk us through this. And this is going to be amazing because we're going to take an actual walk through exactly how Earth works. And the topic about actually walking through is really important because we're going to go into elements about gravity and how we interact with the outer crust of our Earth. We already talked about our relationship with planets in our solar system, but now we're going to take a deep dive into the physical portions of our Earth and all those interactions uh, within our solar system as well. So I'm going to bring up another great presentation for you guys here that I've developed that will dive us a little bit into specifically how Earth works, and we'll be able to see our interactions with this wonderful planet that we're on. Awesome. So we are going to take a deep, deep dive into exactly how Earth works. And this is going to be great because we're going to go about one element that we all know about or that we think we know about and really explain a little bit more thoroughly about how this actually affects us. All right, so we're talking about gravity, exactly what is gravity, right? So we know that gravity is a force and compared to these other forces that we have, weak forces, electromagnetic force and strong force, gravity is much different. And a lot is still unknown about gravity, right? So we know gravity is what keeps us down on earth, but what are the really fundamentals and what's actually happening, especially in space with gravity? So I'm gonna do a little quick demonstration here and this, we've probably all seen this before, but we all know gravity acts on everything the same way. So we obviously have a little cherry grape here, right? And now we have a water bottle. Obviously two completely different sizes, right? Two completely different masses and weights, right? If I drop these, and we won't be able to see this fully, but if you guys try this at home, you guys will be able to see this. Get different objects that are of different masses and you drop them. They will all hit the floor at the exact same time because of what we know of as gravity, right? That gravity force now is attracting this to Earth, okay? And this is really cool to think about because we think about space and we think about gravity, right? And we've all seen pictures of astronauts in space. SpaceX just did a recent launch and our astronauts just came back to Earth here. But we see them out in space and you've seen people on space shuttles on the International Space Station and they're all floating around, just weightlessness is floating through space. And we all think that would be the coolest things. I know I would personally love to be in space so I could experience weightlessness. But what exactly is happening? Is it because that we don't have gravity in space? Is that why astronauts float around inside a space shuttle? That right there is a misconception, right? It's not because there's no gravity in space. We know that gravity exists everywhere, right? Because the planets all orbit around the sun, right? The sun exerts its gravity, which keeps all these planets in orbits that are millions and millions of miles away. So why are astronauts floating around in space? There's no gravity in space. There's gotta be no gravity in space, but we know there is gravity in space. So something else is happening, okay? So this obviously isn't a space shuttle, but well, within our eyes, this is a space shuttle today. This is, our, this is our new SpaceX space shuttle. And we have a little astronaut inside here, right? He looks like a peanut, but he's, he's an astronaut, okay? And he's inside this space shuttle. And so we're doing this launch from the Kennedy Space Center. And this space shuttle is going to air, right? We now have a force that exerts, that sends this space shuttle into orbit, okay? Now, at some point, these astronauts start floating around. Is it because now they've gotten to the space and there's no gravity? This all has to do with elements of force, okay? So what's happening, we experience something that's called weightlessness, okay? This experience that we see, that we perceive as us floating around is actually due to weightlessness. So what is actually happening in space is that now that you are now in free fall, this is what we call free fall, you and the space shuttle have, were in the same force going upwards, okay? And now you're now flying through space the only force that's exerting upon you is a force of gravity. So gravity is still exerting on you. The only difference is now that you're in space, you are moving at such a speed that there are no opposing forces. So if I'm sitting down in my chair, I have a force that's keeping me settled in my chair. That's the opposing force from the chair that's keeping me upwards. But if you're in space, you as the astronaut inside here and the space shuttle are both free falling at the exact same time. So the only force exerting upon you is gravity. There are no counter forces that are acting upon you. And that's what we experience as weightlessness. And we can even do that on earth. Very, very, very uh, small way we can see if you're standing, like next time you're standing on an edge, you're on the edge of a curb or on the edge of your bed or couch and you jump into the air for that very split momentary second, right when you're at the top of your height, when you jump up in the air, 
you experience weightlessness for a very, very brief second. If any of you have experienced a roller coaster, been to Six Flags or any amusement park, right? You experience weightlessness for a brief second. Once you now descend down, that feeling of your stomach feeling like it's coming out of your mouth, if you feel like you're going to throw up, that split second right there, you are experiencing weightlessness. So that could happen even while you're here on Earth. But eventually what happens is you're attached to this roller coaster, and now you have a force that's coming now from the roller coaster, which now gives you experience of you feeling like you have weight. But that's not happening in space because you are in constant free fall, you and the space shuttle in constant free fall. And so there are no forces now that are keeping you weighted to the ground. And so that's why you experience weightlessness. And if any of you guys have ever heard of something called the vomit comet, have you heard of the vomit comet before, Eric? I have, yes. I have a friend who went on the vomit comet. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. That's really awesome. Great. You can actually pay to go on the Vomit Comet, uh, but it's also used for training for astronauts. If you guys look up the Vomit Comet, they call it the Vomit Comet for a reason, right? That experience I talked about of you being on a roller coaster and your stomach feeling like it's coming out of your mouth, right? You have that feeling of you wanting to vomit. That's exactly what happens on the Vomit Comet. So the Vomit Comet is basically a plane that's here on Earth. It's not in space. It's right here on Earth. And what it does, it does the same simulation that a roller coaster does. It drops and it goes up like that, and it goes through these different variations of dipping and diving, dipping and diving, and going back up and forth. That experience, that gives you the experience of weightlessness for about 20 to 30 second intervals. It's the same feeling that you get if you're ever on an airplane and you're experiencing turbulence. You're flying comfortably in your airplane, and all of a sudden you get turbulence, and the plane just dips like that. You get that feeling, right? That is weightlessness that you're experiencing. And that's the same thing that astronauts are experiencing in space. The only difference is they never have a force that's now opposing them from the opposite side. So now they have this feeling of being constantly weightlessness because there's no the normal force that's now being exerted. So that's actually what's happening in space. Not the fact that there's no gravity. It's because of the fact that you're in a constant state of free fall. And that gives you the perception of feeling like you have no weights. Isn't that pretty cool, Eric? That's wild. So let me get this straight. So the astronauts inside the spaceship, and because they're both falling at the same exact rate, the astronaut inside the spaceship, it, it's, it's, everything's falling at the same time, so the astronaut has a sense of weightlessness. There's nothing pushing against uh, Exactly. So I gave the example of a grape. Oh, I dropped my grape here. I gave the example of this uh, cherry tomato here and a, water and a water bottle. Two different masses, right? One of the masses is a space shuttle. One mass is the astronaut. You drop them, gravity pulls them down at the same speed. So we know that you're moving at the same speed. So when, ash when a space shuttle takes off and is going thousands of miles an hour to rocket us into space, we now have a velocity going at the same speed, but gravity is still bringing us down at the same rate. So you and the uh, space shuttle are moving at the same speed, but you're also being brought down by gravity at the same speed as well. So you inside are moving at the same speed as you're traveling through space. And so when you push off on the walls of a space shuttle, that now gives you the ability to move because now you're exerting different forces within, side, within the space shuttle, but you guys are free falling at the same time. And that's what actually gives you the perception of weightlessness. It's not because there's no gravity, it's just because you inside the space shuttle are now having no normal forces exerted upon you and you're free falling at the same speed, which is pretty cool. That was really neat. Yeah, thanks for that demo, that was, that was cool. And this really dives us into a really general understanding about gravity. And obviously, gravity can be discussed and dictated and talked about in multiple different ways. But we're going to start with the most fundamental way that gravity is discussed, which as well as presented by Isaac Newton. Newton's law of universal gravitation. So we have a, a nice little uh, picture chart here that kind of shows you exactly how this equation works. So we're trying to talk about force. And we need to understand exactly how these interactions with masses occur. So let's say mass one would be our sun and mass two would be the earth. There's a distance between the sun and the earth, which is uh, replicated by uh, the number r, right? That's going to be our distance between it. And then each uh, element has a certain mass. So earth has a mass and the sun has a mass. And so those different masses are multiplied together. And then we also have g right there, which is now a gravitational force. And so we know that two bodies exert a gravitational attraction to one another. And this equation is the most general equation that we use in order to be able to understand the force of gravity. 
And it's really applicable in most uh, situations, in most applications, which is why Isaac Newton's discovery about this force was so amazing at its time, because we still use it to this day to be able to dictate most of our applications when it comes to gravity. And I say most because there's also elements of gravity that we're still determining, we're still knowing about, and one of them that came to be in our early uh, 20th century. So now that we have a better understanding about uh, Newton's law, now we can go into a little bit more in depth about uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. This is really important to know because this gives us a better understanding about gravity and how it works. Put, put it simple, the geometric theory of gravitation developed by Albert Einstein is what the general theory of relativity is. And this gives us a better dynamic understanding about gravity. It redefines gravity as a geometric property of space and time. So more so than just looking about how masses uh, be able to combine and how the energy of masses attract to each other, this goes into more of the concept about space, the space that around us and how time influences that. And it really gives us a better understanding about the existence of black holes, which are regions in space where space and time are extremely distorted that not even light can escape. So it gives us a better understanding about the impact about gravity and how gravity disrupts everything around us and how gravity it moves in waves and how those waves uh, interact with the curvature of space and time. And so this was really important to know because from a physics perspective, it gives us a better understanding breakdown from the uh, molecular level about how gravity interacts with our environment and our surroundings, which is very, very important to know in order to be able to take us into the next segment, which is about gravity's effects, okay? So we know gravity and us revolving around the sun has an impact about our orbit and how we orbit around the sun. And it's really important to know because our orbit is not uh, uh, it's not perfect, right? It's not, it's not a perfect circle that we go around. And the way that we move around that we talked about earlier with Saturn when we we're talking about our planets, uh, the way we rotate really has an impact about our shape. And so as the Earth spins, it's not a perfect sphere, even though we always look at it as this perfect round globe. It actually has more of an oblate shape to it uh, because of the fact that our Earth is com com uh, always rotating and always revolving as it goes around the sun. So simple little breakdowns about our Earth's orbit, which is affected by gravity. Uh, Earth does a rotation in 24 hours. So we all know about a day, we go through sun time, night time, and that's dictated by our us rotating around the, Earth, around the sun and also our revolutions as we're going around each day. So one, at one time of the day, we're facing the Earth, which is when we call daylight. And another time of the day, we're facing away from the Earth, uh, which is nighttime. And so from a very simple level, that just really goes down to us orbiting around uh, uh, the sun and our revolutions. So 365 days is the time that it takes for the Earth to make one complete rotation around the sun. And it's not exactly 365. We really break it down to a decimal level 0.242199, which really has an impact when we think about leap years and why every four years we add extra days in order to be able to get us back track to that time. And so Earth is moving at a very, very, very fast speed, 108,000 kilometers per hour around the sun. And when we really take about a look about the most unique thing about our uh, Earth, which is the connection that we have to our moon. And this is really important to know because the moon really dictates a lot of elements here on Earth. But in order to really understand exactly how those elements are dictated by the moon, it's really good to know about how the moon was actually created. Um, much like some of our other uh, planets that we've discussed that we know have unique tilts to them, which are believed to be by impacts from an, either another planet or another large rock like an asteroid, we also believe that the moon was created from a large impact uh, from another planet or from a large rock which actually broke off debris from the Earth, which eventually created our moon. And we know that because much of the residue, much of the rock formations that are on the moon are very similar to that, that on Earth. But what is it about gravity that the moon really does for us? This really comes down to the tidal effect that we have. And the tidal effect is really unique because that is the breakdown about how everything on Earth moves. And so obviously the sun has a huge impact and control on Earth. But since the moon is much closer than the sun, and we already talked about uh, Newton's uh, gravitational forces, we know that as the masses are closer together, that gravitational force is going to be stronger. And so that's how the moon is able to have a gravitational impact on Earth. 
this constant pull and push as we're evolving and as we're circling around uh, the sun and as we're rotating as well and the moon is rotating around us, this constant pull and push has a dramatic effect, particularly on things that are fluid, things that move around. And the largest thing that we have, the largest mass on Earth that moves around is water. And so we're able to really actually take a look from a physical level about how gravity affects us here on Earth. And that is what we call high tides and low tides. Anytime you go out to the ocean, you want to explore tide pools, we always know that at one time, the tide comes in, the water level uh, comes much higher onto our shores. And at another time, at approximately 12 hours, twice a day, uh, the tide actually moves out farther. And this is all dictated by the gravitational pull that the moon has on the Earth. And it comes at opposite sides. So as the moon is rotating around us, the, ch the tide changes. And so that's why we're able to have low tides and high tides at various times of the day. So we know that this tidal force has a large impact on the topography of Earth because we already talked about how water has a huge impact on Earth because of the fact that it's able to traverse through different landscapes and form canyons and mountain ranges. This, uh, this tidal force that uh, the moon exhibits on Earth also has a dramatic effect because as those tides come in and those shores come in and out, that also affects the landscape and the geography of Earth as a whole. So then we go from the tidal effects about gravity to having a better understanding about the atmospheric effects. So we touched on this earlier when we talked about how unique Earth's atmosphere is and what it does to protect us. But let's dive a little deeper about how physically that layers of our atmosphere actually protect us. So we're gonna dive into a little bit of the different elements of our atmosphere. We have the one that's farthest away, which is called our exosphere, which is the upper limit of our atmosphere. This is the far reaches that our atmosphere extends. Past this, we are going into deep space. So everything below our exosphere is what we consider our overall atmosphere. From the exosphere, we go into what is called our ionosphere or the thermosphere. And this is the layer where electrons and, uh, and ionized atoms are, right? These are electrical charged particles uh, that are floating through this portion of space. So now these are one thing that's really able to dictate radio waves and communication, which we'll go into a little bit further when we talk about uh, our electromagnetic light spectrum. So the thermosphere is very, very important because this is where now all the electrical components of Earth are really dictated. And when we go from the thermosphere, we now go into the next layer of our atmosphere, which is the mesosphere. And this is very, very important. We've all seen meteors that come into Earth, and we all know about the force uh, that uh, astronauts have when they're re-entering back into Earth, right? Things burn up as they come back into our atmosphere at really, really high speeds. This is because of the mesosphere. And this is the area where meteors burn up. This is where elements that are now falling into our atmosphere, where they're terminated, which is another element of protection that our atmosphere provides for us. And this is where the largest temperature drops are. So as we continue to go higher up, once we get into the mesosphere, this is where we see a large decrease in temperature because of this altitude. Now going uh, farther in from that element, we now go into the stratosphere, which is one element that we, of the atmosphere that we all talk about because this is where the ozone layer is. And we've all heard about different things like climate change and global warming having impacts on the ozone layer. This element is really important because the ozone layer is what protects us. This is where all the harmful solar radiation and all the solar rays that the sun is putting out, this is where they're all stopped and this is where the protection zone of our earth is because the ozone layer actually absorbs all the harmful gases and ultraviolet rays that are emitted for the sun. So when we talk about holes potentially being in our ozone, which could potentially affect us as humans, this is exactly what we're talking about because this layer is pivotal in protecting us from all those harmful rays that are coming from the sun. And once we pass from the stratosphere, we now enter into the next layer of our atmosphere, which is the troposphere. And this is about five to nine miles high. So as we continue in altitude, we now get to this layer of our troposphere. And this is where all the climate conditions of Earth exist. Everything that we know as far as hurricanes, tornadoes, um, all the different atmospheric changes that happen on Earth, and everything that we consider weather, storms, raindrops, uh, rainstorms, all these different weather conditions all happen within this element called the troposphere, which is really, really, really unique because it's not the high, it's not the thickest part of our atmosphere, but it is where everything that we know of that dictates all the life and functions on Earth happen. 
um, Earth's temperature is calculated in this, uh, in this area of our atmosphere. And we talked a little bit about this earlier about how we actually dictate temperatures. And sometimes we think the sun is emitting uh, different heat, which it is, right? But the, when we actually do a temperature reading and we put a temperature gauge out there, we're not actually reading what the sun is putting out. We are actually reading what the reflection and what the radiation off of our Earth's crust back up is. And so as the sun is emitting different heat rays down to Earth within this troposphere, and within our, and, and which is why the crust is so important to know, this radiates that heat. And so when we talk about temperature, that is what we're actually talking about. We're talking about that radiated heat that's bouncing off of Earth's crust, which is what we actually measure, which is really what makes it unique when we talk about planets like Venus having a really, really high temperature because of that radiation that's being trapped in there because they don't have an ozone that protects them like we do now all these different elements now of heat can be contained within the troposphere and continue to protect us and so that's why it's really important to have a good understanding about all the elements of our atmosphere um, and this dives us a little briefly into how we understand weather and seasonal effects right because as we're revolving around uh, the sun and based upon our tilt as well which is about 23.5 degrees all these different angles now cause different seasonal effects. The sun's rays hits differently to different parts of the world as we're tilted, right? So these tilted effects affect the northern and the southern hemispheres differently. And that's why it's really, really important to have a better understanding of that troposphere because all these weather patterns are dictated within this element. We have the longest days of the year, which is our summer solstice, and the shortest days of the year, which is our winter solstice. And in between these days, we have either our daylight rising or our daylight decreasing between these times. Um, these are the days that the sun reaches its highest and lowest points in the sky, like I said, which are known as solstices. And so that's why it's really important to have an understanding of the combination of the atmosphere and all these different things that really dictate uh, how our Earth moves and how the gravity affects different elements of us. And so when we have a better understanding from the deep level between not only our Earth's core, but then the atmospheric conditions and the troposphere, and then also understanding Earth's crust and our interaction with the planets around us and our moon, this gives us a better fundamental understanding about all the components of Earth and everything around us that really affects all the patterns that we know that give us life and also make Earth what it is. So I hope that was helpful. And uh, if you have any insight or any questions on that, Eric, I'd love to chat away. Yeah, Hip Hop MD, that was awesome. I appreciate that overview of how Earth works. You know, there are a bunch of different mechanisms that, that Earth relies upon uh, to you know, to do what it does. And so, um, I, you know, going into a little bit of detail on each of those was really helpful and hopefully helpful for the students and teachers that'll watch this. So thank you so much. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And we're all enjoying this wonderful summertime because of our tilt and where we're at right now in this Northern Hemisphere. So I will make sure to enjoy it as well. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>